Welcome to Digital Oil and Gas with Jeffrey Can. I'm Jeffrey. Digital Oil and Gas looks at the impact of digital technology on the global oil and gas industry. If you want to discuss this week's topic further or just stay in touch, you can always reach me at Jeffrey Can on Twitter or at jeffreycan.com. Welcome back to Digital Oil and Gas. My name is Jeffrey. I'm the host of the podcast. And I am delighted to welcome back to Digital Oil and Gas for a sequel, um, Omar Morales, who uh, is the architect behind the, the uh, Omar project. Uh, and uh, when we first met, I was working in, in the oil and gas industry, but has, has a career change. And I'm very curious to learn more about that. Uh, so, Omar, welcome back to Digital Oil and Gas. Hey, Jeffrey, thank you for having me back. Happy to be here. Happy to talk to you. And uh, yeah, just talk about the big change I've had recently. <laughs> big change. You know, you're not the only one to wrestle with big change. I think there's a, a lot of oil and gas professionals are staring at the the world around them right now and thinking, hey, is this the time? Uh, and in your situation, you you made that call um, actually uh, last year. And so uh, which is what raises my uh, my interest and curiosity. Um, but um, but just to kind of set the table here, let's uh, begin with you sharing a little bit about your uh, your broader background, uh, and um, and that's will that lead us into this uh, uh, conversation about um, where and how you've changed careers. Yeah, sure. So the so I'm a professional engineer, and background is mechanical, and I started in a refinery and a chemical plant right outside of uh, Louisiana, actually. When I got the acceptance to where I was going to work, it was like, you know, this town, Louisiana, I'd never heard of it. And I was just like, well, I need to go check that out to make sure I actually want to move down there because I'm coming from New Jersey, which is where I'm originally from, and uh, ended up working at the refinery and chemical plant for a couple of years and did a lot of run and maintain stuff. You know, rotating equipment was what I started out in and then got into project engineering, which in a plant... Uh, is, you know, it's smaller projects. It's many projects that you manage at one time, but they're all for either run and maintain or small capex projects where they're trying to do improvements to optimize. So I got a lot of experience in different fields and got to manage contractors at that point, do construction, see processes and learn essentially what is oil and gas. Cause it's very similar. Even when I went up to upstream mm. and then from there moved up to upstream Got to work on the big mega projects, which was uh, really exciting because these were the the multi billion dollar plus deep yeah. water projects yeah. um, that, that we had in mm-hmm. our group, and then uh, ended up working in that organization for quite a bit of years, and then ended my career um, at Shell at in the deep water organization, working as the deputy lead for the top size engineering for uh, what is the project called whale, which is a major um, project that's going to be in the Gulf of Mexico. So that's, it is a great experience. I had, I mean, I, the learnings are incredible when you go from the scale of what a brownfield project is in a uh, refinery to mm. a mega project where you add a whole bunch of zeros, to everything and <laughs> it's just a great learning for project management too. Cause I think that's, um, one thing that you know when you do mega projects you have to have that part right otherwise you're you're a cost missing cost on something that's in the multi-billions is not uh I never good thing. Yeah, yeah. So the, the, as you say, add zeros, not just a zero, but zeros uh, to the n- number of people involved, the length of time it's going to take, the the procurement contracts, the uh, it's just on and on and on the scale <laughs> until you actually spend time on one of these projects. It's it's difficult to appreciate. I mean, they literally are military type disciplined run organizations <laughs> at that at that level. Uh, the uh, the the small scale stuff though. Is still a great learning ground i mean if even if you want to do something as simple as repair a cement footing or or uh, replace a pump in a in a facility i mean that still teaches you management of change and uh, the uh, uh, planning uh, structures um, light it light end contracting if you like so still great great value though oh yeah and i and i would say sometimes i would think i mean when you're managing multiple smaller projects that can be just as challenging it's just different types of challenges Mm -hmm. it's more of you know being maybe resource constraint and trying to do all those different things at once but 
those those projects i think oftentimes especially people that are on the front lines of managing multiple small projects are not given the credit they deserve because mm-hmm. It is not easy to, to maintain a plant that's breaking down all the time and that yeah. has a lot of different priorities. So, yeah, I definitely agree with that. Yeah, totally true. Now, uh, of course, the other topic today is because you've changed careers recently, just last year. Uh, interesting time to change careers, I, I'd have to say. Uh, it's in the middle of a uh, pandemic, uh, the worst economic downturn in in, um, in certainly recorded history. The, the Brits say it's uh, you have to go back 300 years of record keeping of economic downturns before you can find something even close to comparable. So a bit of a, a bit gutsy to kind of take off. But clearly, you would have seen some things coming at the industry that were telling you that, uh, you know, the time was probably right to think about a change. And I'd be curious if you could share what, what you saw as the changes uh, on the horizon that, that were p- uh, compelling you or feel like setting the stage for you to consider a, a major career shift. Yeah, sure. And I guess first I should mention, I forgot to mention that now I'm at uh, Advana, which is a battery startup, and I'm the director of project management. Um, yeah, yeah, of course. What led, yeah. what led me to make this change, um, it was multiple factors. I think one of them was seeing that renewables were no longer just a niche. They started becoming something that was very, it started becoming um, extremely viable probably a couple years ago. And then it yep. just became a matter of, is this going to follow technology trends or is this going to, is this going to be somehow go away? Mm-hmm. And I was, I started following it a couple years ago and I'm a huge fan of Tesla and what they've been doing. And I'm, I'm a fan of like a lot of their other companies and how they're pushing the, the envelopes and, and what they're doing is new things. Mm-hmm. And, and starting to see that it, like electric car in itself is going to be a very attractive, it's going to be extremely attractive to consumers and it already is. And seeing that last year and just seeing the growth and, and knowing, okay, most of our demand in oil and gas is coming from, it's coming, a lot of it's in transportation and what happens when that starts going away. And yeah. I think these types of questions, I mean, the audience will know, we're, you know, being in that environment, we were asking a lot of these things to, in our, to, or thinking a lot of these things. And for me, I just said, look, I'm at a point in my career where I've done a lot of amazing things. I've built some major projects, but um, this new field, which for me was batteries, looked really promising because of just the growth potential of what could become of batteries. I think right now, batteries is really kind of in the infancy of an industry um, mm-hmm. for where it can go. And the, the other thing about it is the more I've dug into batteries and the more I understand about the chemicals and the the, you know, the actual technical side of it, which granted is, you know, I'm still learning it, but I'm learning that there's a lot, there's still a lot of things we don't know about it and mm-hmm. there's still a lot of ways to improve it. So, so I think seeing some of that, seeing the growth in other alternatives. And then, um, I think the one, and those are the, the, I think the two main factors, the other factor I will say is COVID was a factor for me mm-hmm. because it just made me realize you know, we oftentimes, you know, like, you know, I think sometimes I think, oh, things are so certain and it just threw everything up for me in such a way that was like, wow, not, you know, we, we, we assume certain things are very secure mm. and sometimes they're not. And I think this was something that having the opportunity to be on the cutting edge of where I think technology is going, is always something I've been passionate about. And I was like, well, there's no better time than now to start. So yeah, it's part of the part of the reason I jumped. Well, I think there's an age element here too. If I could just be uh, you know ageist for a second, but uh, you know there, you're you're also at an an age in, in your mm-hmm. career where um, you know your your ability to shift gears. And at the same time, you could forecast forward that you have enough time. If you made, if you, if you, if this bet turns out wrong, if you like, you still have time. You can, you can, you, you still have time in front of you to change gears again. So it's, it's not like it's a, it's a risk, but it's, it's kind of mitigated <laughs> because you've got like a, you know what I mean? You got an, you got another right. pathway you could, you could prosecute. So some, some people may not have that luxury, I think. Yeah. And I think that's a hundred percent part that the decision for me was very challenging because I had a great opportunity where I was. Oh yeah. Um, 
so and I think part of it definitely comes into that, which is, you know, where where does this thing end up in twenty years? And then you have to look at your downsides because mm-hmm. there's obviously anytime you make any sort of change, it's major. There's going to be some downsides that you have to account for. And yep. age for me and runway and thinking about, okay, well, what exactly that, all those things went through my head. Mm-hmm. I, I had to. Yeah, exactly right. Well, I share, I share your perspectives around the changes coming at the industry. They are coming fast and furious. Uh, the, the, the proportion of the barrel of oil that goes into transportation is on the table. And for the first time in, in my life, uh, you know, there actually is now a viable alternative uh, to, uh, to going to the gasoline station to get fuel. That's, uh, that's pretty, uh, you know, it's very interesting for people to think about that. And, and, I th- and a lot of oil professionals, oil industry professionals, I, I suspect are weighing this up. Uh, when, when, um, when, as they're, th- they're sort of thinking about it, as you were talking to your colleagues um, in, you know, across the industry, um, uh, d- what was your sense of the sentiment? Was that uh, was this a, 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 a bubbling along conversation with an uncertain future, or was it becoming more clear to to to, to other people of your age and your 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 background that uh, that you know the, the opportunity to change gears and get onto other energies actually is is now pretty viable. So I know that I don't know of anyone that's in the oil industry that doesn't have this forefront in their mind. Hmm. Um, just just yeah. from the conversations that I'm having after leaving, yeah, so I know it's definitely something that people are thinking about. Think about yeah. the, the forefront of their minds. I think hmm. the other portion of this is, and this is the thing that's I think where people are debating. If there's a debate on people whether I stay, do I go, do I try to make a new career? A lot of companies, especially the majors, are pivoting. They are moving into renewables. Like a lot of them are buying up wind or solar investments. That's and true. there are arms and energy, new energies and new types of renewable groups within these major oil firms. So mm-hmm. there true. is an opportunity for some people to jump into, you know, whatever the future is within their companies. And that's mm-hmm. I think where a lot of people are probably taking their first looks at maybe what the future might hold. But then the, the other part of it is like the transition is not going to happen overnight. So yeah, we're we still got pl- uh, there's still a good amount of time we just don't know when the when does the when does it really become to where it's like i don't you know i, I really probably should be in some in another <laughs> different part of this like yeah. maybe i can still stay at the same company but i'm doing the wind turbine now or maybe i'm doing the natural gas plants that we need for whatever intermittency hydrogen, yeah yeah exactly yeah i mean there's real trade off questions <clears throat> at, under, underneath all this because Although the the barrel of oil, you know, if I, and any depending on who or what numbers you look at, twenty five to fifty percent goes into transportation. The other fifty percent is going into petrochemicals and uh, fertilizers, and they're they're not going anywhere. Like we we don't have alternatives for that. So the oil industry isn't going away, but it absolutely is going to change. And uh, the 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 this is the probably the great uh, the great um, wrestling match people have mentally is is um, is, is timing. So, um, was there anything that's uh, any? Was there any event that's that uh, that um, sort of compelled you to move on? Like, did you did you go to a con? Well, a conference? Did you get a virtual conference where uh, you you got introduced to saw these novel technologies, or was there an event at at uh, you know that that um, kind of said, "Hey, that was the time to go." Mm, I don't know if there was a single event that made me yeah. go. I, I'd actually started doing a lot of research on renewables because I. I, I did. I was concerned with this big shift, and mm. I mean, I was building. You know, the future tra- trajectory for me would probably be a PM for a major project, exactly, mega project. Yep. Which, but you know, if that's going away, and then it's like, well, what would I do next? So I mm. started researching. You know, what else is out there that somebody with my skill sets, you know, engineering, oil and gas, that's related. What could they do? And then started researching where the opportunities were, and I I started really focusing on wind. Because it just seemed like a natural fit for somebody that was in deep water, like somebody oh, that that's true. had the a lot experience. Of offshore turbines, you know, right? Offshore, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, mm-hmm. it's a big offshore turbine. They're mm-hmm. doing a hundred at a time in sequence and parallel. It's big money. Yep. Um, but as I started looking into that, it, there's definitely opportunities there. But the way they're structured in wind is a little bit different how than how we would do it in oil and gas. Um, especially more of the majors because, you know, a lot of these companies like GEs or the Vestas or the, um, you know, 
the the, the OEMs that create these turbines, mm. they're starting to do a lot of long term contracts on their turbines. So it's it's really, you know, from a project management and a complexity standpoint, you're putting a lot of that risk and on the design portion on your OEM actually. And mm. then you're kind of getting almost like a turnkey solution. Yeah. So cash at, cash flow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so where actually I found that, you know, your engineering you know, and there's still a lot of opportunities in this because there's going to be a ton of turbines, especially in North America, is really on the transmission side, which is, you know, where do we tie up to? How do we get into the grid? And what kind of upgrades do we have to do to the grid? Almost like the equivalent of oil and gas subsea tiebacks, except, you know, you're not moving umbilicals. Well, you're, mo you're basically installing umbilicals offshore yeah. for these turbines. <clears throat> but the umbilical is holding a copper uh, wire as opposed to flowing molecules. So it's uh, uh, an engineering company I know is, uh, has, has talked to me about the future for engineering firms and uh, particularly in capital projects related to oil and gas. O oil and gas, because of their nature, uh, the, um, molecules, vape, they vaporize easily, they asphyxiate, they're poisonous, they, they're pollutants in their, in, in their free state. Um, require an, a, an enormous amount of specialized engineering to con to contain them. And uh, his observation was, you know, the electrical world isn't as complicated, actually. Uh, and so this this res this huge um, capability set we've built up in oil and gas to manage and maintain and build these assets might not actually be in as great a demand if we shift over to a more electrical uh, electrical infrastructure. Uh, so his his worry was, well, how how do we replace that um, in in our engineering world? It's a really good question, actually. No, it's an excellent question. <laughs> I think mean, you don't get much harder than building an oil and gas platform no. or refinery as no. far as engineering. It's it's really on the cutting edge of. Of yeah, human ingenuity. Yeah, totally. Yeah, so if you're not doing a moonshot, you're building a big oil plant. It's, it's, it's at that scale. So, uh, so uh, now if I think about Tesla and cars, you know what? I, I have tires. Cars down the road are going to have tires. So, uh, a stable business to be in, in, in the auto, and in, in if you're in the automotive world, is tires. Um, but batteries is is probably the next area. You know. So, is that why batteries for you? Was it because of the kind of the engineering chemical um, interaction, or were you just seeing it at such a, a nascent stage in development? There just was a long way to go. Is is. I think definitely both. Mm. One was just that there's there's a lot of opportunity in batteries still, mm. and the amount that we need is enorm. I mean, the the amount of batteries that are going to have to start being developed and manufactured and produced and get out from basically the raw material all the way to the mine to the factory into the battery, it is incredible to think about mm. and. We're not even in the United States. We're not even close to what we're going to need. Yeah. So the, the 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 value factor that I saw for myself was, look, I'm good at building things that can build things at a at big scale. At scale. That's mm -hmm. probably my specialty. Mm -hmm. And if I can help the industry scale, which I believe they're going to need a lot of that, then then that's where I can provide, I think, a lot of value. Yeah. And that's kind of what I looked at batteries. I think it's got a long way of scaling to go. Mm. And Hopefully, you know, I can help them get there. You've touched on a couple of skills already that, that you know, you, you, you've developed over the years that uh, you know, presumably a lot of oil and gas professionals would have. Uh, project management, uh, contracting, uh, managing at scale, these big capital projects. What, what kind of skills did you, you know, now that you're on the other side on a different venture, what kind of skills uh, have you uh, taken from your your oil and gas world and and applied uh, directly in in this new role. And here, the reason I'm curious is, you know, what what's portable amongst what what you've got in oil and gas? What what where can you take it to, to into other industries? Yeah, surprisingly, quite a bit. Um, hmm. So definitely, definitely the 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 whole structure of oil and gas from a from a I think a process standpoint, we yeah. have some of the best developed processes in probably in any industry just because of what we're dealing with. Like yeah. we're dealing with hydrocarbons, so we have to be extremely process driven and from a safety aspect, but not only that, but from a design aspect hmm. and. I think moving that from in, into batteries, you're going to see there's a lot of similarities there. Um, batteries have, you know, like lithium. Uh, we're dealing with silicon, which is uh, putting silicon into the to the batteries. Mm. But 
all you know like you're also dealing with other things that you're putting into these batteries right and that process step to make these things um there's there's gonna be some skill sets there from oil and gas that will definitely like you'll be you'll pick it up i think i think relatively quickly Mm. i think the other thing that's um fairly similar is like the facilities role right like if you have facility experience at an oil and gas facility Mm. whether that's a chemical plant refinery upstream downstream it doesn't matter that is not changing in any industry you go to from what i've seen um and it, it's it's a very it's a very necessary skill set and there and those same skills for knowing electrical equipment or sizing pumps or knowing how to spec certain things that will be needed in this new future of whether we have a battery facility if it's a facility for building wind, wind turbines mm-hmm. or whatever the plants are that that skill set's not going away so I think those are really, and those honestly, I think when I look at people in the oil and gas industry, that's usually the way that the the, the roadmap for people go is they start as a, you know, facilities engineer. They start in a more technical role, and then they grow out of that. And yeah. then the other one that I I would say is very relevant is your 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 normal transferable skill set. So like I consider, and I talk about this a lot on the Omar project and on my blog, but project management itself is a it's an extremely transferable skill Mm -hmm. and once you've learned that or mastered that in oil and gas you will you know very quickly you'll realize that that translates very well to any industry there's not not much learning curve there in fact i would say as an industry we're probably better in oil in in project management than some other industries are and then um definitely management and all those other leadership type roles where they transfer real well and certainly project management in in the upstream it's it's uh, you know there's a constant capital cycle every every year you need to drill wells and the wells are treated as little capital projects with uh, multiple owners and uh, and so you have to learn the discipline of of uh, stewarding those they're they're very complicated now i, I was working with a, a business uh, oh, a couple of years ago in calgary just planning to build two um, very, unfortunately, they were very expensive, um, uh, horizontal wells, very deep, uh, and they were in an awkward to reach place. And, but, you know, it's a team of people working for two years to sort of, sort of sketch this out and how they're going to do it. And, and it was all of this dimensionality to it. I mean, it's a, I totally agree with you. The, just the ability to puzzle your way through this is a, a very, very useful skill. Uh, but the, but this also raises the other other side of the coin, of course, is, you know, now that you're on the outside, uh, are there some skills that you uh, now realize um, would ha- have been um, uh, really a, a big asset if you had the opportunity to um, either work on them or perfect them while you were inside the oil industry? So I will say this, and I remember talking to some of my old mentors, right, and they're, mm. they're now retired, and... They would say when they built the first platforms, like, you know, in the, I want to say 70s, yeah. uh, deep water was yep. kind of just starting. Yep. That was very new. Yep. And they would have one project manager, one mechanical guy, one electrical guy, and it was like a team of six of them. They had a contractor. And they would go out and build these giant platforms. <laughs> so they picked up these skill sets, which were very, like, they had skill sets that were electrical, chemical, controls. You, know, you name it, mm. they were picking it up because they, by nature, had to do everything to do it, yeah. themselves almost. Mm. I think where we've gone is, um, as an industry in oil and gas was where we once were kind of, we acted more like, I, wanna, I don't want to say, let's say wildcatters or a little bit more loose when it came to structure. We've mm. gotten much more structured. Yep. And that's because, you know, building more projects, going faster. Okay. Well, you also, remo- you know, for me, I think it removed some of the exposure to some of the other disciplines. So mm. whereas, you know, maybe I, my control systems is not as strong as somebody else who was having to be on the, the initial you know, plant building that up yep. or, you know, the, the, some other surrounding disciplines. So I think the broadness of, uh, of, of, of like those skill sets are probably for me something that I noticed that people that are starting out in renewables or even in like a definitely a startup space, you're just going to see people that, okay, they can do procurement. They can do, they can size a pump. They can size a compressor. They can like, there's their gamut of, of tool skill sets is very wide mm-hmm. because of the nature of being forced to do that. Yeah. And there are no established rules right now. So 
as these new industries emerge, I think the type of engineer that they're probably more are looking for are somebody that just can come in and kind of do a little bit of everything. Yeah. Um, you're not going to have like a niche pocket probably to just go ahead and do something. Yeah. That's a really interesting point uh, that the, uh, that, that sort of um, Swiss army knife utility, a little bit of everything uh, it is, um, it is a skill set that you, to, to a degree, the industry has been working very, very hard to, to eliminate, <laughs> frankly, because the uh, specialization um, uh, means that uh, you, you actually improve uh, things like the, um, the uh, process design or the reliability because you have this deep expertise. And, and certainly big oil companies tend to organize themselves around their, their um, specializations. So uh, and, and that unfortunately has the, the effect of making people while well, very, very deep, but they're narrow. And what I hear you saying is, well, actually, the, the outside world might value width and not that deep. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so some some advice for people inside oil and gas right now is, is if you have the opportunity to um, step outside your, your normal frame and, and get some experience in a in an, in another area, an adjacent area, rather than going deep and deep and deep in your current area, that actually might be a, a good career uh, a good career move. Particularly if you're thinking you might you might leave the industry at some point. Yeah, I think I think so definitely. Mm. Now, what advice would you have for others uh, in in you know, out in the industry right now in a similar situation, you know, would you, uh, would you, you know, what would you counsel them to do at this point? It's a, it's a tough question. And I know it's a very personal question for a lot of people. So it's yeah. obviously going to be, you know, what's best for you and your family. That's first and foremost, take care of yourself and your family. Yep. Always. I think the secondary, secondary part of that is I, I, I read, I, I look, I'm always following what's going on at oil and gas and looking at the news and looking at, you know, how things are playing out and, it definitely looks like electric is def- is not going away. I mean, more and more car companies are going that way. We know the shift is happening. I don't think the disagreement – I sometimes see it on LinkedIn when I post things and people are like, well, <laughs> do we have enough renewables to actually do it? And I'm like, are you not following what's going on? Like, they, we definitely they, – they will. We don't have it right now, but it's coming. Mm. So – I see that there's def- there is a transition happening. I think if you if you acknowledge and you accept that it's happening, which I think most of the oil majors have at this point, yeah. Um, then the next question is, well, what do I do? And that is very dependent, I think, on really what your company's business plan long term is, because there are some areas where people can st- people are still going to be making money on renewables and. You know, like I see some companies and they're great at they're great at trading or they're great at managing projects or they're great at, you know, doing certain skill sets. So if they can get into these companies in the right way, then, you know, I think that might be a good opportunity mm-hmm. to maybe just stay. Mm-hmm. If, you, if you're if you're if you're good where you're at and you, you think maybe an opportunity can, can wind up. I think if you've had an itch, this is my my uh, my also pitch to people that have had an itch for a while <laughs> to try something new. Mm-hmm. If you've had an itch for a while and you've been looking to get into technology or on the cutting edge of things, I don't know if at least in my lifetime we'll see something that's going to be as revolutionary as what's about to happen. Mm. And I do think this would be a great time to get into the industry because, uh, right now nobody knows what they're doing. I mean, we have a lot of people that have been doing this for maybe like a a senior person would be 10 years Mm. max. Yeah. I remember talking to somebody in the wind industry in the United States and they're like, well, ideally we would want somebody who had 10 years of experience or 15 years and was, you know, did blah, blah, blah. But yeah. that doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. So right now, the best, the second best time, if, if this is something that's already was on your mind or something you're thinking about, I think right now is a good time. Yeah. I, I share that that sentiment. I, I um, left my uh, my uh, role at at uh, in the big four uh, professional services industry uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, I had nowhere to go. <laughs> but you know, my sense was it was time for a change, uh, and, um, and and so for those of us who are. Um, uh, have a that that itch as you say it's probably easier to give it a scratch and, and get on with it uh, there are a lot of people though unfortunately in the industry who um you know this it's just not it's just not uh, within their um their makeup their their way their their way of going about things to uh to scratch that itch 
So, and, you know, that's the, there's the, there's the thing, you know, <laughs> well, it's, it won't be for everybody, but uh, for those of us out there who, who have the itch, yeah, now's the time to scratch it. Lots of upside. So tell me about the, the new business. What are you, uh, what, 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 what does Advano um, do? New, new, new battery technology or is it, um, yeah. yeah, tell yeah. me more. So I j- jumped into a company that's basically on the mm. cutting edge of battery technology. What they're doing yeah. is they um, they're a materials company uh, which really deals with batteries. So they they, yep. they 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 work on the the anode part of it. So there's the lithium, and then it's it's usually got an anode that's graphite. And what they've developed is a silicon solution or substitute that works really well in batteries that then can be used to increase energy density, increase the, the time that you can drive your cars or whatever, use your phone, and then you can charge up quicker. Mm-hmm. Um, this is like, and when I say cutting edge, like we have one of those, I'm still getting these terms right. I remember I'm a mechanical engineer, but they have a, <laughs> they have one of those like, micro, it's, I think it's, uh, it, it cuts lasers into like the, the, the almost the nano part nano of thin. the thin. Yeah, it's nano. It slices a slice through the silicon, and you can see it and open up the pore sizes. And I'm like, these PhD people in here are doing some, some things. So they, <laughs> they are. Uh, when I say the science is still early, it's because there's so much you can still do with these things, and, um, and that's why I'm excited about the battery space because I think not only is there a lot we can do, but then we can obviously there's a lot we can build. Yeah, because. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, so that's what they do. They build silicon um, specialized for, uh, you know, any sort of uh, any sort of application. Maker. Yeah, that's brilliant. <clears throat> lots of lots of batteries to come. So, uh, what else are you working on besides battery uh, innovations? It's one of the things I'm working on right now, and it's it's about to be released. Uh, is the uh, Engineering Leadership Academy, and mm. it's part of the Omar Project. You can also go to theomarproject.com and get it that way as well but it's a course on leadership for engineers and uh it's something that is uh, something i'm very passionate about because a i'm i'm an engineer but i think when you're leading engineers or as an engineer and you want to move into leadership there are things that we have in common as engineers that are challenges and problems that uh, i've definitely faced and i think other people have and i'd like to just build a community for that help people to to learn um, how they can move into different engineers. The first, the first course that I'm offering is called um, Reengineering Your Brand for Leadership. So it's for people that may have been um, in technical roles or subject matter experts for a very long time, and they're looking to rebrand themselves as something different. That's something, yeah. There's, there'll be lots of interest in this, I'm sure. Appreciate it. Yeah, I'm excited for it. Uh, hey, um, Omar, this has been a terrific um, uh, 30 minutes to talk about uh, uh, your career, where it's gone. Uh, and again, the, the concept here is uh, you and I were talking about it earlier was uh, how does um, if you're in the oil and gas industry and you've, you're thinking about career change in the middle of pandemic or you've, you know, you're, you might you think you might get laid off for heaven's sake or maybe you have been laid off. Uh, is there is there a, um, a bright light out there? And uh, you you've grabbed it. So good for you. Well, appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. So let's. Uh, um, let, if people want to learn more about uh, about the battery company, where where do they go? Uh, at Vano. Uh, they could just Google. If you Google, it, I'll spell it for you. Yeah, um, please. It's a a d v a n o. A d v a n o. At Vano. Mm-hmm. All right. Brilliant. Omar, thanks very much for coming on the show today. Thank you. I'm super excited. There. Great, great chatting with you. And it was a. Uh, Always a good chat. Yeah, always always good get a laugh, too, which is good. <laughs> yeah, don't take it too seriously. So this has been another episode of Digital Oil and Gas, along with, you know, like re- rebranded as Digital Batteries <laughs> in honor of Omar's visit. Uh, and if you like what you heard, uh, by all means, press the like button, leave a comment, share this with your friends so that others can find this content. And until we meet again, likely next week, uh, we'll uh, uh, have yourself a uh, safe uh, weekend. Bye for now.